The Theology of Christian Perfection Part 24 Continuing There are many sins opposed to the virtue of charity, but the detailed study of them belongs to moral theology. Here only a summary treatment of these defects can be attempted. Hatred is the first sin against charity. If it pertains to God, it is a most grave sin, and indeed the greatest that man could commit. If it is directed to one's neighbor, it is also a serious sin and designates an internal disorder, even though it is not the one that is most harmful to one's neighbor. The worst is that which proceeds from envy. Spiritual sloth which is opposed to the joy of the divine good which proceeds from charity, is a capital sin. It usually proceeds from the sensate taste of men who find no pleasure in God and find divine things to be distasteful. The vices which flow from spiritual sloth are malice, rancor, pulusanomy, despair, indolence towards commands, flightiness of mind and distractions by unlawful things. Envy is supposed to spiritual joy occasioned by the good of one's neighbor. It is an ugly sin which saddens the soul because of the good seen in another, not because that particular good threatens us, but because it is seen as something that diminishes our own glory and excellence. Of itself, it is a mortal sin against charity, which commands us to rejoice in the good of our neighbor. But the first indeliberate movements of sensibility or envy regarding the insignificant things could be a venial sin. From envy, as a capital vice, proceed hatred, murmuring, defamation, delight at the adversities of one's neighbor, and sorrow at another's prosperity. Discord, which is opposed to peace and concord, signifies a dissension of wills in those things that pertain to the good of God or the good of one's neighbor. Contention is opposed to peace by means of words, either by argument, complaint, or disagreement. It is a sin if it is done in the spirit of contradiction. If it is done to one's neighbor or to the truth, or if one defends himself by means of harsh words in an unseemly manner. Schism, war, strife, and sedition are opposed to the peace of charity by means of deeds. Schism signifies a departure from the unity of faith and the sowing of division in religious matters. War between nations and peoples, when it is unjust, is a grave sin against charity by reason of the countless injuries and upheavals it causes. Strife, which is a kind of particular war, almost always proceeds from anger, and in itself it is a great fault in him who provokes such a situation without the lawful mandate of public authority. It has its maximum manifestation in dueling, which is punished by the church by the penalty of excommunication. It is also expressed by sedition, which consists in forming bands or parties within a nation with the object of conspiring against legitimate authority or promoting tumults or rebellions against lawful authority. Scandal, which is also opposed to justice, is frequently a grave sin against charity because it is diametrically opposed to beneficence. Scandal consists in saying or doing anything that would be an occasion of sin for one's neighbor. The Gift of Wisdom 
The gift of wisdom is a supernatural habit, inseparable from charity, by which we judge rightly concerning God and divine things through their ultimate and highest causes, under a special instinct and movement of the Holy Ghost, who makes us taste these things by certain connaturality and sympathy. We shall explain the definition in order to gain a clear idea of it. Like all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, wisdom is a supernatural habit, but it is precisely that gift which perfects charity by giving it to the divine modality it lacks, as long as charity is subject to the rule of human reason, even illumined by faith. By reason of its connection and with charity, all the souls in the state of grace possess a, the gift of wisdom as a habit, and it is incompatible with mortal sin. The same is true of all the other gifts. It is proper to the gift of understanding to have a penetrating and profound intuition of the truths of faith in the order of simple apprehension, without making any judgment concerning them. Such a judgment is made by the other intellectual gifts, but in different ways. Concerning divine things by the gift of wisdom, concerning the created things by the gift of knowledge, concerning the application to our concrete acts by the gift of counsel. So far as it presupposes a judgment, the gift of wisdom resides in the intellect as its proper subject, but since it is a judgment by, by a kind of connaturality with divine things, it necessarily presupposes charity. Hence the gift of wisdom, causa lighter, has its root in charity, which resides in the will. The consequence is that this is not a purely speculative wisdom, but a practical wisdom. To be sure, it belongs to the gift of wisdom in the first place, to contemplate the divine, which is like the vision of first principles, but in the second place it pertains to wisdom to direct human acts according to divine things. Whereas other gifts perceive, judge, or act on things distinct from God, the gift of wisdom is primarily concerned with God himself, giving us a savory and experimental knowledge of him which fills the soul with indescribable sweetness. By reason of this ineffable experience of God, the soul judges all things else so far as they pertain to God, and does it so in their highest and supreme reasons, that is, through divine reasons. As St. Thomas explains, he who knows and tastes the highest cause par excellence, which is God, is disposed to judge all things by their proper divine reason. Thus, through the gift of wisdom pertains properly to divine things, there is no reason why its judgment cannot also extend to created things, and discover in them their ultimate causes, which connect them in some manner to God. This is like a vision from eternity which embraces all creation in one scrutinizing glance, relating all things to God. Even created things are contemplated by a wisdom in a divine manner. It is evident from this that the primary object, formal quote object, of the gift of wisdom embraces the formal quad object and the material object of faith, because faith looks primarily to God and secondarily to revealed truths. But it is differentiated from faith by reason of its formal quo object, since faith is limited to believing, while the gift of wisdom experiences and tastes that which the faith believes. In like manner, 
the primary object or the formal quod object of the gift of wisdom embraces the formal quad object and the material object of theology uh, which considers God and all revealed truths with their conclusions. But they are differentiated inasmuch as theology takes revealed truths as first principles and, by reasoning, deduces conclusions from them, while the gift of reason contemplates the same principles by the illumination of the Holy Spirit and does not properly deduce the theological conclusions, but perceives them by a kind of intuition or by a special supernatural illumination. Finally, the secondary or material object of the gift of wisdom can be extended to all the conclusions of the other science, which are contemplated in the same divine light which shows their relation to the supernatural ultimate end. The philosophers defined wisdom as certain and evident knowledge of the things through their ultimate causes. He who contemplates a thing without knowing its causes has only a superficial knowledge of the thing. He who contemplates a thing and knows its proximate or immediate causes have scientific knowledge. He who can reduce his knowledge to the ultimate principles of the natural being possesses philosophic wisdom, that purely natural wisdom which is called metaphysics. He who, guided by the light of faith, scrutinizes with his natural reason the, the revealed data of revelation in order to draw from them their intrinsic virtualities and to deduce new conclusions possesses theological wisdom the highest type of natural wisdom which is possible in this life but based radically on the supernatural order but he who presupposing faith and sanctifying grace judges divine things and human things through their ultimate causes by a kind of divine instinct possesses supernatural wisdom, and this is the gift of wisdom. Beyond this there is no higher type of wisdom in this life. It surpasses only by the beatific vision and the uncreated wisdom of God. From this it is evident that the knowledge which the gift of wisdom gives to the soul is comparably superior to all human sciences even theology, which already possesses something supernatural. For that reason, a simple and uneducated soul who lacks the theological knowledge acquired by study may sometimes possess, through the gift of wisdom, a profound knowledge of divine things, which causes amazement even to eminent theologians. The special instinct and movement of the Holy Ghost is characteristic of all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. This attains its highest perfection, however, in the gift of wisdom by reason of the loftiness of its object, which is God himself and divine things. Man does not proceed laboriously and by means of rational discursus when he acts under the influence of the gifts, but in a rapid and intuitive manner by a special instinct which proceeds from the Holy Ghost. It is useless to ask why such a person acts in this or that way, or saying this or that thing, because even he himself does not always know. It is the Holy Spirit who operates in him. He has experienced something with great clarity and certitude which far surpasses all human discursus or reason. A certain connaturality and sympathy is another note that is typical of the gifts of the Holy Ghost, which reaches its highest perfection in the gift of wisdom. Of itself, wisdom is a savory and experimental knowledge of God and divine things, 
The souls that experience these things understand very well the meaning of the words of the psalm, Taste and see how good the Lord is. Psalm 33, 9 They experience a divine light which sometimes causes them to fall into ecstasy and brings to them something of the ineffable joy of the eternal beatitude. It is remarkable how precisely and profoundly St. Thomas explains his note, which is characteristic of the gift of wisdom. As we have said, wisdom implies a certain rectitude of judgment according to divine reason. Now the rectitude of judgment can take place in two ways, according to the perfect use of reason, or by a certain connaturality for the things which are to be judged. And so we see that through the discursus of reason one judges rightly concerning the things which pertains to chastity if he has studied moral science. But there is a certain connaturality with these things in judging rightly of chastity in the person who habitually practices chastity. In like manner, to judge rightly concerning divine things through the discursus of reason pertains to wisdom in so far as it is an intellectual virtue, but to judge rightly concerning those divine things by certain connaturality for them pertains to wisdom in so far as it is a gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of wisdom is absolutely necessary if charity is to develop to its full perfection and pl plenitude. Precisely because charity is the most excellent of all the virtues and the most perfect and divine, it demands by its very nature the divine regulation of the gift of wisdom. Precisely because charity is the most excellent of all the virtues and the most perfect and divine, it demands by its very nature the divine regulation of the gift of wisdom left to itself or to the control of man in an ascetical state, it would have to be regulated by human reason according to the human mode. The gift of wisdom is absolutely necessary if charity is to develop to its full perfection and plenitude, precisely because charity is the most excellent of all the virtues and the most perfect and divine, it demands by its very nature the divine regulation of the gift of wisdom. Left to itself or to the control of man in the ascetical state, it would have to be regulated by human reason according to the human mode. Charity is a divine virtue and has wings for soaring to heaven but it is obliged to move along the earth because it is under the control of human reason and because, in a certain sense, it is necessary to compromise in accordance with prudence due to its weak condition. Only when it begins to receive the full influence of the gift of wisdom is there given to charity the divine atmosphere and modality which it needs as the most perfect of all theological virtues. Then charity begins to breathe and to expand in its proper element. As an inevitable consequence, it begins to grow and to increase rapidly, carrying the soul with it as if in flight, soaring to the regions of the mystical life and to the very summit of perfection, which it never could have done if it had remained under the control of human reason in the purely ascetical state. From this sublime doctrine follow two inevitable conclusions which are of great importance in the theology of Christian perfection. The first is that mystical state is not something abnormal and extraordinary in the full development of the Christian life, but it is the normal atmosphere which grace 
as a divine form demands so that it can develop in all its virtualities through the operative principles of the infused virtues especially through the theological virtues which are substantially divine therefore the mystical state ought to be something normal in the christian life and it is as a matter of fact normal in every perfect christian the second conclusion is that an actuation of the gifts of the holy spirit in human mode besides being impossible and absurd would be utterly useless for the perfecting of the infused virtues especially of the theological virtues since the latter are superior to the gifts of the holy ghost by reason of their nature the only perfection which they could receive from the gifts is that of the divine mode which is exclusive and proper to the gifts because the theological virtues under the rule of human reason would remain forever in a purely human mode of operation by reason of its elevation and grandeur and by reason of the sublimity of the virtue which it perfects the effects which wisdom produces in the soul are truly remarkable the following are the more characteristic effects of this gift 1. It gives to the saints a divine sense by which they judge all things. This is the most impressive of all the effects of the gift of wisdom so far as they are manifested externally. One would say that the saints have completely lost the human instinct or the human manner of judgment and that it has been replaced by a certain divine instinct by which they judge all things. They see everything from God's point of view, whether the little commonplace episodes of daily life or the great events of life. In all things they see the hand of God. They never attach their attention to immediate secondary causes, but pass them by to arrive immediately at the supreme cause who governs and rules them from above. The saints would have to do great violence to themselves in order to descend to the point of view which judges from a purely human and rational standard. An insult or any other injury that is done to them causes them to turn immediately to God, who is the one that wishes or permits that they be exercised in patience and thus increase their glory. They do not dwell for an instant on the secondary cause, which is the evil or malice of men, but they rise immediately to God and judge all things from divine heights. They do not consider something disgraceful in the way that men of the world do, but they consider as disgraceful only that which God would consider such, namely, sin, lukewarmness, infidelity to grace etc they do not understand how the world can consider as treasures those little baubles which sparkle and glitter because they see clearly that there is no true treasure but god and the things that lead to god as aloysius gonzaga used to say of what avail is this to me for eternity the gift of wisdom shone most brilliantly in Thomas Aquinas. He possessed a remarkable supernatural instinct in discovering in all things the divine aspects by which they were related to God. There is no other way of explaining his divine instinct and insight except that the gift of wisdom operated in him in an eminent degree. In modern times, another admiral example of the operation of the gift of wisdom is sister elizabeth of the trinity according to father philippon who studied her case profoundly the gift of wisdom was the outstanding characteristic of the doctrine and life of this saintly carmelite nun of dijon she was perfectly aware of her sublime vocation and even succeeded in con in contemplating the trinity 
so that she experienced the distinct persons of the Trinity present in her soul. The greatest trials and sufferings were unable to disturb for a moment her ineffable peace of soul. No matter what misfortunes befell her, she remained as unmoved and tranquil as if her soul were already in eternity. It makes saints live the mysteries of faith in an entirely divine manner. As Father Philippon says, the gift of wisdom is the royal gift which enables one to enter most profoundly in the participation of the deiform mode of divine science. It is impossible to be elevated any higher outside than the beatific vision introduced by charity into this intimate intimacy of the divine purses at the very heart of the Trinity, the divinized soul, under the impulse of the spirit of love, contemplates all things from this center. God is present to the soul in all of his divine attributes and in all of his great mysteries. In the measure which is possible for a simple creature to gaze, the gaze of the soul tends to become identified with the vision which God has of himself and of the entire universe. It is a godlike type of contemplation experienced in the light of the deity, and it is the soul experience ineffable sweetness. In order to understand this, it is necessary to recall that God cannot see anything except in himself and in his causality. He does not know creatures directly in themselves nor in the movement of contingent and temporal causes which regulate their activity. He contemplates all things in his word and in an eternal mode, according to the degrees of his providence and, and in the light of his own essence and glory, the soul which becomes a participant in this divine mode of knowledge by means of the gift of wisdom penetrates to the unsounded depths of the divinity, and it contemplates all things through the divine. One would say that St. Paul was thinking of such souls when he wrote, The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. It makes them live in union within the three divine persons through an ineffable participation in their Trinitarian life. As Father Philippon writes, While the gift of knowledge asks as an ascending movement, raising the souls from creatures to God, and the gift of understanding penetrates all God's mysteries from without and within by a simple loving gaze, the gift of wisdom may be said never to leave the very heart of the Trinity. It looks at everything from an indivisible center. Thus made godlike, the soul can see things only from their highest and divine motives. The whole movement of the universe down to its tiny forms, thus lies its gaze in the all-pure light of the Trinity and of the divine attributes, and it beholds them in order according to the rhythm with which these things proceed from God. Creation, redemption, hypostatic order, it sees all, even evil, ordained to the greatest glory of the Trinity. Finally, it looks aloft rising above justice, mercy, prudence, and all the divine attributes. Then it suddenly discovers that all these uncreated perfections in their eternal source, in the Godhead of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which infinitely surpasses all our narrow human concepts and leaves God incomprehensible and ineffable even to the gaze of the blessed, even to the beatified gaze of Christ. It upholds that God, who is the supereminent in his simplicity, is simultaneously unity and trinity, indivisible essence, and fellowship of three living persons, really distinct 
according to an order of procession which does not affect their consubstantial equality. Human eye could never have discovered such a mystery, nor could have human ear caught such harmonies, and the human heart could never have suspected such beatitude had not the Godhead stooped to us by grace in Christ in order that we might enter into the unfathomable depths of God under the guidance of his own spirit. The soul that has reached the heights never departs from God. If the duties of one state should so demand, it gives itself externally to all types of work, even the most absorbing work, with an unbelievable activity but in the most profound center of the soul, as St. John of the Cross used to say, it experiences and perceives the divine company of the three, and does not abandon them for an instant. In such souls Martha and Mary have been joined in an ineffable manner, so that the prodigious activity of Martha in no way compromises the peace and tranquillity of Mary, who remains day and night in silent contemplation at the feet of the Divine Master. For such a soul, life on earth is the beginning of eternal beatitude. 4. It raises the virtue of charity heroism. This is precisely the purpose of the gift of wisdom freed from human bondage and receiving in full the divine atmosphere which the gift gives the fire of charity reaches tremendous proportions it is incredible what the love of god can do in souls that are under the operation of the gift of wisdom the most impressive effect is the complete and total death of self such souls love God with a pure love only in his infinite goodness and without the mixture of any human motives or self-interest. True, they do not renounce their hope for heaven. They desire it more than ever, and they desire it primarily because they shall be able to love God and with greater intensity and without any interruption. If it were possible to glorify God more in hell than in heaven, they would, without hesitation, prefer the eternal torments. It is the definitive triumph of grace and the total depth of one's own self. Then one begins to fulfill the first commandment of the law of God in all the fullness which is compatible with the state of misery and weakness on earth. As one regards one's neighbor, charity also reaches a sublime perfection through the gifts of wisdom. Accustomed to see God in all things, even in the most minute details of spiritual life, the saints see him in a very special manner in their neighbor. They love their neighbor with a profound tenderness which is completely supernatural and divine. They serve their neighbor with heroic abnegation, which is at the same time filled with naturalness and simplicity. Seeing Christ in the poor, in those who suffer, in the heart of all their brothers, they hasten to aid their brethren with a soul that is filled with love. They are happy to deprive themselves of even necessities of life in order to give them to their neighbor whose interests they place and prefer above their own, as they would put the interests of Christ before their own. Personal egoism in the relation to neighbor is completely dead. Sometimes the love of charity which inflames their heart is so great that it is manifested externally in the divine foolishness which is so disconcerting to human prudence. St. Francis of Assisi embraced a tree as a creature of God, and desired to embrace all creation because it came from the hands of God. 5. 
It gives to all the virtues their ultimate perfection and makes them truly divine. This is an inevitable consequence of the previous effect. Perfected by the gift of wisdom, charity extends the divine influence to all the other virtues, because charity in the form of all other virtues, the whole pattern and organism of the Christian life experiences the divine influence of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That perfect plenitude which is seen in the virtues of the saints and is sought in vain in souls which are less advanced by reason of the influence of the gift of wisdom through charity all the Christian virtues are cultivated and they acquire a godlike modality which admits of countless shades and manifestations according to the personal character and particular type of life of the saints. But in any case they were all so sublime that one could not say which of them is most exquisite. Having died definitively to self, being perfect in every type of virtue, the soul has arrived at the summit of the Mount of Sanctity where it reads that sublime inscription written by St. John of the Cross, Here on this mountain dwell only the honor and glory of God. Following the teaching of St. Augustine, St. Thomas states that the seventh beatitude corresponds to the gift of wisdom. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Matthew 5, 9 he proves the fittingness of this application from two points of view, as regards the reward and as regards the merit. As regards the merit, blessed are the peacemakers, because peace is nothing other than the tranquility of order. And to establish order pertains precisely to wisdom. As regards the reward, they shall be called the children of God. Because we are adopted children of God by reason of our participation and likeness in His only begotten Son, who is eternal wisdom. As regards the fruits of the Holy Spirit, following three pertain especially to the gift of wisdom, charity, spiritual joy, and peace. To the gift of wisdom is opposed the vice of spiritual dullness. It consists in a certain defect of judgment and lack of spiritual sense which prevents one from discerning or judging the other things of God through that connaturality by taste or contact with God which comes from the gift of wisdom. Worse yet is the vice of fatuity which prevents a person from judging in any way of divine things. Dullness is opposed to the gift of wisdom by privation. Fatuity is opposed to it by negation. When this dullness is voluntary because a man is submerged in earthly things, it is a true sin, according to the teaching of St. Paul, who says that the animal man does not comprehend the things that are of God. And since there is nothing that so engrosses a man with earthly things as the vice of lust, it is primarily from lust that the spiritual dullness proceeds, although the vice of anger also contributes to it, so far as its violent movements impede right judgment. Apart from the general means such as recollection, a life of prayer, fidelity to grace and humility, one can dispose himself for the actuation of the gifts of wisdom by using the following means, which are within the workings of ordinary grace. 1. To see and elevate all things from God's point of view. How many souls, even among those who are consecrated to God, fall into the habit of judging things from a purely natural and human vo point of view? If things do not go their way, they accuse others of all sorts of imperfections and even malice, 
and when things proceed according to their personal good pleasure, they attribute everything to God. Actually, there are, they are willing to do God's will whenever it happens to coincide with their own interest. The truly spiritual man accepts all things, whether pleasant or painful, with a spirit of equanimity, and if things are painful or even unjust, he can still see the spiritual value of such experiences, if only as a means of purification and penance. Even the smallest works are seen in the light of supernatural value and merit, and while he is conscious of the defects of others, he is even more aware of his own imperfections. 2. To combat the wisdom of the world, which is foolishness in the eyes of God, St. Paul f speaks frequently in this manner. But the greater part of men rely on the world's wisdom. Yet Christ constantly warns us in his teaching that we should expect to be a contradiction and a paradox to the world. This does not mean that the world as such is evil, but it does mean that those who live and act for worldly goals and according to worldly standards will inevitably have to jettison the standards of God the lives of the saints are replete with the instances in which the gift of wisdom causes them to perform actions which were foolish in the eyes of the worldly men, but were divine and prudent from a supernatural point of view. 3. Not to be attached to things of the world, however good and useful. Everything in its proper place. Even the most holy and most beneficial created goods can become a source of temptation and sin if a man is too attached to them. As soon as anything outside of God himself becomes a goal or an end in itself rather than a means to God, the soul is diverted from its proper orientation to God. This applies not only to the obvious dangers, such as wealth and pleasure and ambition, but to the study of theology, the liturgy, devotion to particular saints, penitential practices, even the use of the means to sanctify itself. All of these, if exaggerated or sought after with a selfish spirit, can become obstacles to union with God and the operation of the gift of wisdom which flows th from that union. 4. Not to be attached to spiritual consolations. It is God's way to lead a soul to him by conferring spiritual consolations, but the time comes when these consolations are removed and the soul is tested, purified, and made strong in love. One must strive diligently to cultivate a true devotion, which implies a resolute will to serve God at any cost. Man naturally is drawn to those things which give pleasure, whether spiritual or sensual, hence all the more reason for detachment and self-denial. The common error is to love the gift rather than the giver and for that reason God withdraws consolations when the soul is ready to pass on to an another phase of its spiritual development. To love and to serve God in darkness and privation is by far the greater proof of one's fidelity than to love him in periods of delight and consolation. 